Hello. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, thank you all for being here. Okay, show of hands. Uh, who wants to hear me give my talk in English? <laughs> and who wants to hear me give my talk in Russian? Good. Я не говорю по-русски. Спасибо. Okay, I'm Zuko, and I'm the um, the founder of the Zcash project, and I'm the uh, I'm the CEO of the Zcash company. How does it work? Oh yes. Okay. How much time should I talk? For thirty minutes? For half an hour? Okay. I'll talk for about thirty minutes. All right. This is all about Zcash, um, and it's really I'm, I'm mostly going to talk about the history of cryptography. Uh, starting with, oh, these are my slides instead of your slides. Oh, well. Uh, starting with 50 BC, when Julius Caesar was one of the first users of symmetric cryptography. And symmetric cryptography is, of course, where Alice wants to send a message to Bob, and she doesn't want, if the message gets intercepted, she doesn't want the interceptor to be able to read the message or to change the content of the message. So when Bob gets it, he'll be the only one who gets the message, and he'll know it's the right message that Alice sent. And symmetric cryptography was the only kind of cryptography for uh, 2,000 years from, from when Julius Caesar was doing it for military reasons in 50 BC until when Alan Turing was doing it for military reasons during World War II. But symmetric cryptography has a really deep limitation, um, which is that you use this key to protect the message. So Alice uses this key to encrypt and protect the message before she sends it. In order to read the message, Bob needs to use the same key. And that means symmetric cryptography is no use for Alice and Bob to talk to each other to send a message unless they earlier were able to securely deliver the key. So that means symmetric cryptography is only useful for two people who have a pretty good relationship because it's expensive and difficult to establish this key sharing between the two parties. And if you want to talk to someone and you have never previously established a shared key with them, then symmetric cryptography cannot protect the message that you want to send to them. So it's a deep limitation. But it was the only kind of cryptography that anyone knew about for 2,000 years until the 1960s and 1970s. This is uh, Whit Diffie and Edelman and Ralph Merkel. And in the 1970s, these people came up with a new concept, a new direction in cryptography called public key cryptography. I'll get to these guys in a second. Here's some more guys. I'll get to that in a second. OK, in public key cryptography, it's a really different idea. Now, Bob creates the key. Bob has the key. And Alice is able to send a message to Bob using Bob's key. And they don't already have to have a shared, secret, protected communication between Alice and Bob. Even if they've never talked before, Alice can get a copy of Bob's key um, over a cheaper, relatively insecure channel. And then she can use that to send the message to Bob more securely. This is a really weird idea. And in fact, when these guys first came up with it, all of the scientists and mathematicians of the time didn't believe them. They didn't believe that it worked because it's kind of mind-boggling how it didn't make sense to the other scientists how you could get a secure message through without previously having a secure shared key. But here's the next interesting part of this story. It turns out these were not the first people to discover public key cryptography. 
the first people that we know of to discover public key cryptography were a pair of mathematicians named Cox and Ellis who worked in Britain for the British military. And 10 years earlier in the 1960s, Cox and Ellis discovered the concept and a mathematical implementation of public key cryptography. But the British military would not allow them to publish it to the world. They kept it as a state secret. And the British military never did anything with it because they didn't understand what would be the point or how would people benefit from this kind of structure. It didn't make sense when they were used to, to that. So if Diffie and Hellman and Merkel and Reves Shamir and Edelman had not taken an unusual and courageous step, then we might still not know about public key cryptography. We might still all be using symmetric cryptography, which means we wouldn't have the internet because the only people who would be able to securely communicate with each other with symmetric cryptography would be, I don't know, a few governments or a few banks or a few important players, but everyone in the world would not be able to communicate safely with everyone else if they hadn't heard about public key cryptography. And, and it's a really interesting fact. These folks, Ravesh Shamir and Edelman, and Diffie and Hellman and Merkel knew that the United, they were working in the United States. They correctly guessed that the United States government in the form of the National Security Agency would attempt to suppress their discovery. And, and they were right. The NSA did attempt to suppress their discovery. They attempted to um, uh, threaten them if they were to publish it and to take control of it so it could become a state secret. And so in order to prevent that from happening, these folks contacted a guy who wrote a popular column in a magazine called Scientific American. This was before the internet, right? And so <clears throat> the way information got around was getting printed on slices of dead tree and shipped in boxes all around the world. And this is a very popular magazine, and the most popular part of it was a column that appeared every month. The magazine came out once a month, and every month the most popular part of it was a column called Mathematical Games, which was just a column of fun and interesting puzzles or curiosities in mathematics as a way to educate people about mathematics. So these mathematicians contacted the guy who wrote this column. His name was Martin Gardner. And they said, we have a discovery, a scientific breakthrough, and we're afraid it will be suppressed, and we want you to make sure it gets out. And he did. He took, uh, instead of printing the normal mathematical game that he had been pre preparing months in advance, he, at the last minute, replaced it with this, which is um, part of the mathematical discovery that they had made, and so that it would get printed and shipped around the world in the magazine before the NSA had a chance to respond and try to suppress it. And that worked. That, as well as a couple of other things that they did collectively, succeeded at, at making this information known, this science known, where the previous generation 10 years earlier had not succeeded at publishing it. And so that's why uh, everyone, all the scientists around the world, learned about public key cryptography. And we were eventually able to use that for the internet. Now, it's an interesting fact that it takes about 20 years from a discovery until it becomes useful for lots of people. So this, these discoveries were done in the 1970s, but it wasn't until the 1990s. Well, the internet also was born in the 1970s. But also, it wasn't until the 1990s that the internet and public key cryptography got traction and got deployed to a large number of people. Now, during the, during the interim, there was other research. And during the 1980s, a pair of researchers named Goldwasser and Macaulay came up with a third new invention. This is Goldwasser and Macaulay in the 1980s. And their invention, or their discovery, was zero-knowledge proofs. And zero-knowledge proofs are even more mind-boggling of a concept 
than public key cryptography is. And lots of people may uh, be forgiven for not really believing that this can work. <laughs> The idea of a zero knowledge proof is something like, suppose this, it, the idea is we're going to make it so, let me review real quick. Remember how in symmetric cryptography you have this problem. You want to deliver the document, like suppose the document's your driver's license or your ID card, and you want to deliver the document over to this person securely so that they can verify whether you're allowed to drive. And you've got to use cryptography so that other people can't spy on your driver's license and take a copy of it while, like, while it's going across. And so that this person will make sure that they see the real driver's license and nobody else tampered with it while it was going across. That's what cryptography is good for. Great. Okay. And we know how with public key cryptography, it's easier and you're able to do it even if you don't previously have a relationship with that person. So you could send the driver's license right across using public key cryptography. Well, the idea <laughs> with zero knowledge cryptography is actually you don't need to send the driver's license. Instead, we'll make a mathematical proof of some facts about the driver's license, but it will not reveal anything about it except for the fact that you want to reveal. So for example, you could say, here's a proof that, there, that there's a document and it shows that I'm over 18 and I have a license to drive from a country, for, from this country or from one of the countries, and you can make this proof, and it doesn't reveal your name, and it doesn't reveal your birth date, and it doesn't reveal your address or anything. And since it reveals so little, and since it cryptographically proves the important fact, you can just uh, share it. You don't have to securely deliver the proof. Um, nobody can tamper with it or spy on it to learn anything. You can just broadcast it, and then this guy can know that you're licensed to drive even though he never saw the document. Okay. That was in the 1980s that Goldwasser and Macaulay discovered that idea. And uh, here's a neat fact. The, um, the most prestigious award you can get for computer science is called the Turing Award. So if you're a physicist, the highest honor anyone can give you is to give you the Nobel Prize. If you're a computer scientist, the highest honor anyone can give you is to give you the Turing Award, which was named after this guy. In addition to breaking symmetric cryptography for the military during the war, he also in helped found the whole concept of computer science. Um, so that's why the award is named after him. You know, wonderful fact is that these guys got the Turing Award for having discovered public key cryptography. It took many years until all the other scientists admitted that it was a real thing and it made sense, but then they got awarded the Turing Award for one of the most important discoveries in all of computer science. And another happy thing is that these folks got the Turing Award many years later for one of the other most important discoveries ever in computer science. And remember, this is, all, this is for all of computer science. This is for all of everything about information theory and computers. It's not just for cryptography. But these two cryptographic discoveries, public key cryptography and zero knowledge proofs, are two of the most important things in all of computer science, according to the people who decide the Turing Award winners. OK, now the next thing, the next event. OK, and then, and then the internet and public key cryptography got deployed to the world. And then the next thing that happened was Satoshi Nakamoto, his discovery of Bitcoin. Uh, and he has not yet been granted the Turing Award for the discovery of Bitcoin, but I'm sure it will happen. I'm not sure what the rules are about giving the Turing Award to anonymous people, but it doesn't matter. We'll just have to change the rules because this is one of the other most important discoveries ever in computer science. And of course, you know, you know a lot about Bitcoin and blockchain here already, right? Um, this just symbolizes that there is, these symbols are proof of work. This is the symbol for proof of work. 
And these are transactions that are embedded into a blockchain, and the blockchain is linked together with secure hash functions so that no one can change earlier blocks and still match later blocks without everyone noticing. But the effect of all this is you can distribute and share data around to the public or to a large group instead of relying on some central party to manage the data for you and you have to trust them to manage the data correctly. Instead, we're all going to have this blockchain to um, to be sure that the data hasn't been tampered with. And then with that, you can, the first thing, the first thing anyone did with blockchain was make a payments system on top of it, and that's Bitcoin. Okay, so now, take a drink of water. Okay, so now how these cryptographic ideas apply to payment systems. Well, in the olden days, back when we had nothing but symmetric encryption, this is what banking was like. And um, there were only a few banks, and they had to have an expensive um, connection established between them over which to send messages. And what did the messages say? You could send a message from one bank to the next and say, hello, Bank B, this is a message from Bank A, and we request that you move some money from one account to another. Now, this is the way banking worked all the way back for hundreds of years. And with the event of public key cryptography, like I said, public key cryptography enabled the internet, which is really important. Like, the internet has improved almost everyone's lives in almost every way in education and science and government and entertainment and family and everything. Um, and public key cryptography was a key part, it may be the key part in my opinion, but maybe I'm biased, uh, for why the internet became possible. But public key cryptography did not have such a radical effect on banking, at least not at first, not until Bitcoin. The first thing that happened was just the exact same thing where we only have three banks in town but now you can log into them from your phone because of public key cryptography instead of having to physically walk into the bank to make a transaction um, like I had to when I was a kid, when I was a young person. Um, so that's not very interesting. It's convenient, but not interesting. But what's really interesting is when you add blockchain into the mix, then we get the idea that uh, we can have any number of banks now because secure connections between them are cheap. So now everyone's phone can be that person's bank, and that's Bitcoin. But there's a really deep problem with Bitcoin, which is that it leaks information about your, um, your actions. Um, the way we layer payments on top of Bitcoin is put one of those messages that says, hello, please move money from account A to account B. And then you put that into the blockchain so everyone can see it. And Bitcoin prevents you from the risk of anyone tampering with the message along the way, but it worsens the risk of people spying on the message and learning about you. So it's actually much worse in that way. If you, if you got your paycheck, in Bitcoin, and then you went and bought a coffee with it, then the coffee shop owner would learn your salary, and your boss would learn what you, what you do after work, where you go. And not only the coffee shop owner and your boss, but probably everyone with, an, with enough effort, if they uh, hired someone to help or used a machine learning algorithm, they could figure out what you got paid and, and where you went. Uh, Bitcoin is completely insecure and dangerous to use for actual consumer payments. Um, and that's not, that was not well appreciated at first. When Bitcoin was new, people thought that since you don't have your name in it or your address, you just have a, you just have a Bitcoin address instead of like your home address, 
uh, people thought that meant that Bitcoin was private, and that's completely not true. It's just like 20 years earlier or so when the internet was new, and your, your IP address is just a dotted quad, like a number, four numbers with dots in between. Your IP address doesn't have your name in it or your home address in it, and so people thought that meant using IP, using the internet protocol meant that you were anonymous and had privacy, and that's totally not true of the internet, and it's totally not true of Bitcoin. And it's really hard to fix. There's a lot of, <coughs> there's a lot of simplistic ideas when you're faced with this kind of problem, uh, a privacy leak problem. There's a lot of simplistic ideas that, oh, well, we'll just fix it by this workaround or that workaround. So the first idea um, that Satoshi Nakamoto had was we'll use a different Bitcoin address every time we make a transaction instead of reusing the same address over and over. And this is one of those simplistic ideas that seems like it might help at first, but if you really dig into the science, it hardly helps at all because um, statistical and deductive uh, mathematical techniques can sort of see through that kind of noise. All of those kind of techniques are about adding noise or trying to add some noise into the system to cover up uh, the signal about how much you get paid and where you buy coffee. And modern um, mathematical methods like machine learning are all about subtracting the noise back out and finding out what the real signal is. Um, so those are not robust. And people who've studied information security and cryptography have always been well aware that those, uh, those kind of techniques are fragile uh, if the attacker is sophisticated enough to use science on it. So that's why we came up with Zcash is in order to solve that problem. And with Zcash, what we do is we leverage the, um, we leverage the zero knowledge proof magic. So instead of sending a message, instead of sending a message um, that says move money from account A to account B, we generate a zero knowledge proof that says someone did control a certain amount of money and that money has never been spent before and it is hereby moved to someone else but we don't reveal any of the other facts about who like which account id was the original controller or how much the money was, or to which account, which other account it went. And like I say, you can be forgiven for thinking that that is impossible. <laughs> it's pretty mind boggling. But the effect of it is, every miner or validator or full node in the Zcash network can test the zero knowledge proofs to make sure that each transaction is valid in the sense that that transaction does not um, allow double spends of money. Like really the whole point of the blockchain is just to prevent double spends. Um, and in Zcash, the way that the miners prevent double spends is by testing that the zero knowledge proof is a valid proof, which means that that transaction didn't spend any coin that was previously spent but the zero knowledge proof does not reveal which coin it's talking about. It just proves it's one of the unspent coins. Okay, that's the core idea of Zcash. Um, and we, where's our timeline? We launched Zcash to the public at the very, at the end in October of 2016. Um, and so, uh, I'm very proud that it only took 30 years since the discovery of zero knowledge proofs before we managed to deploy it to substantial numbers of real people. Um, and I wonder what other scientific discoveries are happening right now that will take 10 or 20 years before we can get them to more real people. I'm kind of hopeful that the 
uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain world is speeding it up. Hopefully it won't take 20 years anymore. Maybe we can squeeze it down to five or 10 years next time. Um, I'm just about out of things to say in this talk, which is good because we'll have extra time for questions and discussion. Um, Here is, I'm going to, Okay. I'm going to leave this up. Wait, I'm not quite done. I'm almost done. Um, here are some of the things you can do. I'm just going to leave this up for a long time so you can write down all the URLs. Um, because the only value of an open system like this, which public key cryptography and zero knowledge proofs have made, is if the public uses them. Which I guess is the lesson of... I guess it's the lesson of what happened back in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, those people who discovered public key cryptography accomplished two great accomplishments. They discovered a new kind of cryptography that no one had thought of for 2,000 years. And they wrested cryptography from being a military secret into making it a public science for the first time. And it's because it was a public science that the later scientists were able to accomplish what they did and that we're able to have the internet and Bitcoin and Zcash today. And so the last thing I want to say is the only point of having all of this public um, decentralized technology is what people do with it, right? So. Um, We've gotten this far, and uh, I urge you to load these pages and see all the ways that you can learn from this source code and reuse it in your own projects, and you can contribute to this source code, and you can get paid by the Zcash Foundation to do stuff, um, but everyone can contribute, and that's the point. Okay, that's all. Thank you.